Okay. <clears throat> uh, first of all, let me pass out uh, to you, uh, as requested by Mr. Brisky here. Oh, thank you. Uh, the little sheet there, Jesse. This is not everything from last week, but those parts that you said you thought you'd like to have. Go ahead and type those up. Okay. You know, I don't wear the shiny bars. Okay, that's just from last week. It's just we've already been over it. And then um Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Well you're welcome. Yeah, if I can do anything, you know, that you want filled in, I'll I'll try to do that. But uh, anyway. Marriage, the marriage covenant on earth, of course, is typological of the um, marriage between God and his people. And um, when the marriage between God and his people are uh, consummated in the consummation, uh, that's why there'll be no more earthly marriage, because the picture will be realized. The type will be done. So. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, marriage is very informative uh, with regard to the concept of covenant. As you probably well know, the Bible teaches that when you say your vows to your spouse, uh, that is a covenant. And God uh, was married to Israel. And we also find in the New Testament, God has a bride uh, who is the church. And some people believe God has two wives, one Israel and one's the church. And other of, other, others of us uh, believe he has only one bride that uh, spans uh, both Old and New Covenant histor histories. So God does not wind up at the end of the day becoming a, a polygamist. Uh, he has one bride that is gathered all together from Adam and Eve until the end of time and is there in the book of Revelation. But uh, marriage uh, uh, is a wonderful earthly picture of that covenant. We went over it last week, and I got seven things in that sheet. It's a distinctive, exclusive relationship of parties as formed in a covenant. They are ceremony or, or ritual of enactment. Uh, there's an exchange of oath vows, which are words. There are witnesses. That's why you want to invite people to your wedding, have witnesses clandestine weddings and clandestine uh, uh, commitments to marriage are not what the idea is. We have witnesses to the covenant, symbols and seals. There's blood that is generally brought, brought to it because there's a loyalty upon pain of death uh, in most, most covenant transactions. Uh, and then there's union and communion, uh, which is the outcome of that covenant transaction of living together as one flesh. And of course, God dwells with his people uh, in union and communion. Okay, uh, now let's kind of pick up a little bit from last time. Uh, under uh, the covenant on Mount Sinai and plains of Moab, uh, there was five observations, and I don't know if you're able to write all those down, but let me give those to you real quick uh, from what we looked at there. Number one, uh, the giving and oath-bound receiving of the Ten Commandments on Sinai. That was a covenant between God and Israel. So in other words, the giving of the Ten Commandments and the receiving of them by Israel was a covenant. Uh, number one. Number two, it was it was a discreet works nature covenant. That's number two. E, 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 on that level, I mean, you know, this is one of these things you can't say everything about everything, you know, but we're just trying to zone in on the, the, the nature of the oath 
in response to the giving of the law. So anyway, you, you see a discrete na- uh, works nature at least in three points. Number one, the hovering terror of the theophany. Number two, the oath-taking. And then number three, the sanctions for obedience and disobedience. All those inform us that 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 is a covenant of works uh, on that level of Israel's receiving the Ten Commandments and promising obedience to it. Again, it's not the whole story. There's a covenant of grace that's there. It's operative as well. We'll see later. Number three, <clears throat> this is a very big, this is a very important point with regard to when, what we're talking about when we talk about covenant. Is um, that event on the mount of giving the Ten Commandments is the beginning of the Bible as a written word of God. And so thus the Bible as a written text from its very beginning, is covenantal in nature. Very important for us to understand that. Uh, Because everything that follows has to do with the concept of the covenant. Uh, Number four, uh, the, the covenant was enacted so that by way of their obedience, they'd have prolonged and prosperous life in the land. That was the covenant of blessing prolonged and prosperous life in the land, or, I mean, the sanction of blessing. Remember, a covenant is a, a relationship under sanctions, blessing and cursing. The blessing is prolonged and prosperous life. The opposite, the cursing, of course, was, you know, God's judgment, all these problems would occur of dryness, of lack of food, uh, lack of sustained life, your enemies would come in and crush you and bat you around, and eventually uh, you would be uh, kicked out of the land of life altogether, sent into exile, sent down into exile, down into death, uh, the cursing. So set before you life and death in uh, what you had in Deuteronomy before they went in. And then, uh, then just another point that I didn't cover that I think is important to mention is, you know, on number five, six, and seven, you know, we start at Sinai, we get the historical books, we got the wisdom books, and we got the prophets. Okay, we can kind of see how each of those uh, are, are an extenuation in, in some sense of the word of the principle of covenant as an organizing reality for those. Okay, the next question is, well, what about Genesis 1-1 through Exodus 18? What's that? <laughs> you know, is that, you know, everything else is covenant and that's not covenant. Well, well, that's prologue to covenant. I mean, it's distinctively covenant prologue. And uh, part and parcel of ancient Near Eastern treaties at that time, which Deuteronomy is a sterling example of, and you could again, Treaty of the Great King by Klein demonstrates that, is that it's, it has everything to do with the Lord's dealings prior that brought them to this point. Okay, got to kind of get yourself historically situated. You know, like 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 you go see a movie. Sometimes the movie will start in the middle, and then they'll back up, and then they'll go forward. Sometimes the movies will start at the end. And then they'll say, okay, here's what, everything that happened. Then you get back to the, the end of the movie. So they, they do it different ways. Well, the Bible's like that too. All right. the, the beginning point in terms of point in time in history of this as a document is, would be Exodus uh, 20. Okay, then, then you back up and say, okay, what's everything that happened that brought us up to this covenant transaction on um, uh, Sinai? And that would be covenant prologue. You're letting the people know who this God is, you know, the creator of the universe and what has happened and, and, and why is the situation and context you're in, one outside of, outside of Eden. <laughs> uh, and uh, why are we here now? It's because that there's another covenant that was made with our father Abraham that's fulfilled and that's why we were delivered out of Egypt and that's why we're here now today. 
uh, because this other covenant has been operative. And so that's covenant prologue, Genesis 1, 1 through Exodus 18, okay? I should have put this in print, but I just forgot about it. So just you write it in there, okay? All right, and then we looked at, um, you know, the conclusion of the matter, the Old Testament, this, this two, the first two-thirds of our Bibles uh, that we see in the table of contents. And, you know, I mean, if, if you go to the book of Matthew, I mean, you know, that's three-quarters of text, you know, versus one quarter in terms of actual uh, print. That first three quarters of the Bible is the Old Covenant Scriptures. That's what it is. This and it is and it is identified as the Old Covenant. Or as you open up your Bible, it's called the Old Testament. And I mentioned earlier, and I'm comment on this in a little bit. <clears throat> if you want to research this, is something you can research for yourself. But it's it's really a misnomer to call it Old Testament, New Testament. You know, I'll show you a little bit why should be old covenant new covenant and then hebrews chapter 8 uh, right out of the old covenant itself and and out of the terminus of its failure out of the terminus of its judgment of cursed sanctions jeremiah the prophet you know you have all these other prophets they're shaking their finger and warning and you know and calling them back to repentance but jeremiah just says it's done we've now reached the point where you're going to come under the, the curse sanctions. Well, out of, out of the setting then of Jeremiah, uh, he not only uh, brings to bear as the covenant uh, a, a attorney, prosecuting attorney, uh, the covenant sanctions of cursing, but he also is looking off into the future. This is the grace aspect uh, of a new covenant that God will contract with the people of God and enter into with the people of God. A new covenant in the last days, uh, beyond the boundaries of the old covenant administration. Jeremiah looks into and, and we saw how different it was going to be. Now, <clears throat> we want to go to letter D. Is there any dangling questions anybody needed to ask from what we've done? It's kind of up to date now. <clears throat> um, I think it depends. I only got this. So? Where's your papers from last week? Oh, I thought we were getting new ones. I didn't bring it. Sorry. <laughs> well, My bad. Yep. <laughs> uh, I have some, but I don't know where they're at it's right okay. now, Kevin. I, no, no, no. It's okay. I, okay. Just, like, listen real hard. I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we want to now uh, go into, uh, move into uh, Jesus and the use of the Ten Commandments with regard to eternal life. Um, now, that is not uh, uh, entirely new uh, with regard to the Old Testament. And we're going to look at that in a little while to see why that's not entirely new. But uh, let's look and see what he has to say with regard to using the Ten Commandments, with regard to the question of eternal life. And we'll come full circle on this in a little bit, but I think the important thing to understand is how Jesus employs the Ten Commandments with regard to the question of, uh, does he employ them as a covenant of works or as a covenant of grace? So, Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 16 through 19, and as you mentioned there, that you know, it appears uh, <clears throat> in some other places. I think the, the rich young ruler one uh, I may have skipped as an example, uh, simply because the language is not as pronounced. But anyway... Uh, 1916, and behold, one came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Notice, what good thing shall I do? Now, how is he thinking? Words. Right. Yeah. 
And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter life, what? Keep the commandments. And he said to him, Well, which ones? And he mentions the various commandments, right? Then the young man said to him, All these things I've kept, what am I still lacking? So yeah, that is the rich young ruler. Sorry about that. So, <clears throat> and then you can read about this rich young ruler in both Luke and Mark. And it appears there as well. But this one uh, really helped get the idea. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Answer, keep the commandments if you wish to enter life. All right, so, so does God promise eternal life if you keep his commandments? And we should be able to say yes. Otherwise, Jesus was just toying with him. But, but, but even though that's a sincere commitment on God's part, it, we, we know otherwise that it is impossible. And, and it's not because the standard's too high. It's because we live too low. <laughs> you must keep that in mind. Okay, so look at one other passage. is Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. Oh, and then, I, you know, just the, the, the kind of obvious question, I believe, is Jesus speaking here out of a covenant of works or covenant of grace context? The answer is it's a covenant of works context. I mean, it's classic. I mean, it totally fits the bill, right? And so, so consequently, I think we can safely say the old covenant taught this, and Jesus is just continuing uh, to teach it. Verses 25 through 28, now behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, what is written in the law? How does, uh, how does it read to you? And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbors yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, what? Do this and live and you will live. Now, what, what is that? Does anybody know, what is that resonating from? What verse in the Old Testament is that echoing? You almost got the gold star. I'll give you a silver star because it was 18.5. But I give you a silver. I get a star out of that because that's something you want to know. You want to know Leviticus 18.5. You know John 3.16, right? You should know Leviticus 18.5. And the other verse you should know from the Old Testament is Habakkuk 2.4. So those are the two Old Testament verses you should have on your... What was the got them. No. The last one you said? Habakkuk 2.4. Well, they don't put them up in football games, though. Yeah, they ought to. <laughs> so, in other words, the Old Testament taught eternal life for obedience to the law as an abiding principle. Adam, had he obeyed, would have tacked down, secured, staked down for himself and his posterity, eternal life. And Israel, had they obeyed, would have had prosperity and prolonged days in the land of promise, which is a typological expectation or a picture of eternal life. Israel's temporal life was typological or pictorial of eternal life. So the Old Testament from Sinai, which Jesus references in both of these cases, the law from Sinai, uh, is not merely about uh, Israel's relationship to God. It's about mankind's relationship to God on the eternal level. So there's a linking, even though the law was only given to the Jews or those who were assembled there, the, the distinctive seed of Abraham on Mount Sinai in that historical transaction, yet, yet that is pictorial uh, of the race before God. Israel's relationship to the law and coming under the curse uh, as any human being would read that storyline, they shouldn't say, boy, it's a bunch of dummies. You know, you know they tell you, if they only obeyed God, all would have been well with them. I would have been different. No, what you should do is when you read that, you go, sounds like me. <laughs> because it's, it's to be a picture of the human race's need 
because of their fallenness. And that's what Paul gets at, of course, in the book of Romans. Uh, so, okay, so we've got Jesus' use of the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments with regard to the eternal life. Now let's consider Paul in the contrast between the Old and New Covenants. First, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, 1 through 6. Paul had just been discussing that Israel was pursuing righteousness by way of the law and not by faith. Okay? That's Romans, in Romans 9. Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I bear their witness. They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, of course, you know, there's much exegetical ink spent on explaining what do you mean he's the end of the law for righteousness? What is, what is meant, what is not meant, you know, by that? So what does the law call for? The law calls for obedience. If we obey the law, we are righteous. If we disobey, we're not righteous. Well, how righteous, how much righteousness, how much obedience do you need to then qualify as righteous? Total, total. Yeah, total. So there's the fool's errand, right? Uh, if you're going to go after righteousness by way of obedience to the law, you're not going to make there again, not because the standard's too high. Standard's appropriate, but we operate on too low of a level of life. And then look what he says. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall what? Die. No. <laughs> shall live by that righteousness. Okay, now what's being referenced there, Nathan? Leviticus 18.5. Leviticus 18.5. Very good. So I upgrade you uh, from silver to gold star of the evening. So there's no more. I have no more. So don't even try to get them. No more stars. Nathan got it. He got both of them. So there you go. So you have the contrast here of two kinds of righteousness. You see that? There's the righteousness which is by faith that Israel did not pursue, 930. Versus the righteousness which is by law. And those two kinds of righteousness arise out of two contrasting covenants, old and new. Now, uh, these two kinds of righteousness... Uh, uh, it, it, you know, we can identify them, yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, Old Testament, New, Ste New Testament, covenantal, Old Testament, New Testament, covenantal administrations. Yes, you can identify them that way. However, retroactively speaking, if it wasn't for New Covenant grace operating in the Old Covenant, how many people would we have saved out of the Old Covenant storyline? Zero. Right. But praise God, there is new covenant grace operative in the old covenant. Amen. And Paul identifies it, uh, first of all, of course, Leviticus 18.5. Uh, the one text I said that we should all have memorized after we've done John 3.16. Okay, we got the New Testament. Now here are the two verses you want from the old that you want to memorize. Leviticus 18.5 and Habakkuk. 2.4, Habakkuk 2.4, Habakkuk 2.4 says, the righteous shall live by what? Faith. faith, yeah, so the opposite of faith is doing, so even these two kinds of righteousness that we see it distinctly and covenantally administered under the Old and New Test covenants, those two kinds of righteousness were already both present and operative in the Old Testament storyline. Vitally so. So if you know anything about uh, Habakkuk, 
Uh, and we'll just, you know, make brief comment here. Habakkuk is uh, in the Bible, right? There's, and he's one of the minor prophets. And uh, where, where, where is he stationed historically? Uh, where is he stationed historically? Is he st- he's, he's stationed just a little while after Jeremiah, or even overlapping with Jeremiah, because he, he, he is basically waiting for the Babylonians to come and destroy them. And the question in his mind is, we know we're not great, but they are really bad. (laughs) These people are horrible. (laughs) So so he he begins this complaint to God, but but God is um, bringing the curse sanctions through the Babylonians upon Israel. And Habakkuk understands, as the prophet of God, that the curse sanctions should fall for breaking the law upon Israel, upon him and his people. But what's difficult about it is the instrument. Right? These guys are worse than us. Start, Lord, why don't you start with them? Well, I, Start with the dirtiest and get down to us who are maybe not as bad. And maybe by the time you get to us, we're all you have left and you'll relent. Right? You'll be tired. You need a break. <laughs> so, Give an extension. so out of this milieu of Habakkuk's stress is God's, uh, uh, God's word to him is that Habakkuk... Babylon is going to get it too. But in the meantime, what does he say to him? The just shall live how? By faith. The righteous by faith shall live. And so when you get to the end of the book of Habakkuk, right? You know, what, what does Habakkuk say? He says, okay, number one. Number one. There's no cattle in the stall, right? What else does he say? Anybody remember? No grapes, no figs. What's he talking about? No cattle. You know, just we're on bad times. You know, if you got bad times, man, just you know, rejoice anyway. No, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is look, when the curse sanction is coming, in judgment, rightly so. And even though I see it coming, that the old covenant curse sanctions are terminating upon me. And my people, what does he say? I will rejoice. All right, now, if you you get that, you're going to have to say, okay, either Habakkuk broke under the stress of it all and went cuckoo, or he's got something going on that's different. And what he's got going on is different is the reason that he can say, okay, can all these curse sanctions go ahead and crush us and leave us devastated? Yet I will uh, uh, rejoice and I will be like Hind's feet on high places. Okay, what is that? What is Hind's feet on high places? That's the mountains, all right? That's the, that's the heavenly region. The deer, you know, Psalm 42, drinking of the waters in the temple of the Lord, on the mount of the Lord. This is the, this is the deer who's partaking of eternal life. Habakkuk is going beyond the typological of Israel and the land, going up into the higher regions of the heavenly life. And he's rejoicing because he knows that's his terminus. Yes, his earthly terminus is not positive. But he has another terminus that is, that's greater and permanent. It's being like hinds feet on high places. And then the, the answer is, why? And the answer is because of Habakkuk 2.4. The man, the righteous man by faith uh, shall live. See, live with eternal life, hinds feet on high places. And so the principle 
of that covenant is operative uh, even in, uh, in, in the storyline of the Old Testament curse sanction so that Habakkuk is able, as, as, as the flood of the curse is coming and wiping him out, he's able to rise above it, even as hind feet on high places, because he's operating on a different principle of do this and live, which spells death, of believe this and live. Trust in God and his promise, just like the Abrahamic promise was Abraham believed God was counted to him for righteousness. So that was the same ancient promise that Habakkuk tapped into Abraham, which enabled him to arise out of the dismal temporal typological arena into the higher heavenly one, because it was based not upon the righteousness of the law, but the righteousness which is by faith. Would, would it be wrong, though, because yet last week you heard my, you know, I revival and I think our nation is turning bad because of the situation we're in. Would it be would it be would I be off base drawing a parallel between changing my name to Jeremiah and having uh, that outlook, you know, rely on faith and because I really think that uh, myself, I I just see this wave of crap hitting us unless we change our ways. You know, and I'm I'm thinking of moving to the hills but matter of fact, you know, but but is, is, is that wrong? Am I just being paranoid? Or spiritually speaking, or scripturally speaking, with theology, would it be wrong to tie those two together? Or is it, well, no, this is Old Testament, John. This is New Testament now. And does that make sense? Well, I tried to respond to that last week, and I, 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 don't, I don't know how meaningful it was. But, well, no, but hey, no, but, listen, you, but you might have went right over my head, and I didn't realize it. Yeah, well, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, we're going to go to this chart later on in the game here. But anyway, you know, Mount Sinai, right? You know, only Israel is under the uh, the contract with God that if we obey, we'll be damned. If, if we obey, we'll be blessed. If we disobey, we'll be judged, right? Uh, the United States has no distinctive covenant with God or 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 Canada or anywhere else on this earth, Okay. All right. However, however, with, without, you know, just leaving that dead there, the reality of Sinai, uh, though specifically historically contracted as life in the promised land in a historical little place over there in the Mideast where God's purposes are going to pl uh, play out on a covenant of works basis, yet is a reflection of a larger creational reality. And, and you can see that, number one, in the fact that when Paul winds up corralling the human race in Romans chapter 3, he not only brings judgment coming in on the Jew for their violation of the law, but he brings the Gentile in too. He says they're all charged under sin by God's law. So, so that, that to me shows that not only does it have its own distinct and discrete historical application, but it's also a reflection of a creational reality of the whole. So that, so that at the end of the day, you know, God's creation isn't just loose, you know, out there loose and, you know, it's kind of our playground that I have dominion, I can kind of mold it how I want. No, I mean, there's things about, creational life as God has designed it that uh, are either brick walls or things that, you know, will work with you on if you're willing to play that game. You know what I mean? So, so in other words, if, and I gave the illustration that, you know, look, you know, just any guy on earth, if he decides to go ahead and stay with the woman who's a nightmare versus to go sleeping out all over the place, uh, even though both at the end will be unhappy, uh, one will have a sense of contentment and integrity and probably has some basic coherence to his life, and the other one will just be a, would be, you know, like Proverbs says, you know, your seed's dispersed in the streets, you know, I mean, your, your life is just irretrievably scattered to the wind, you know what I mean? <coughs> and you can use that illustration with, <clears throat> if you make a commitment to live your life honestly versus if you live your life to be constantly conning. 
And you know, and and you know, you and I we're car guys, and my brother back in Ohio is a car guy. Well, you get in that culture very long. What you're gonna find is that 90% of the people, the car guys, they're con, they're little con men. They're always trying to get a deal and get something for you, and and then you take your car fixed. And these guys are playing these. There's just so much of this out there that it's hard to find a mechanic or another car guy that has some basic honesty. Well, my brother back in Ohio, who's not a Christian, is meticulously honest. That's his moral commitment. And there's benefits that he has about it. I mean, he's a certain kind of person. His life works in a certain kind of way. And, and part of that is because he has a basic moral context in which he operates out of that, that I would say that fits more into the realm of what reality is. You know what I mean? So anyway, so you take you apply that to a nation. There's no nation that has a particular covenant with God. But nonetheless, in terms of the creation itself, it, it does have inbuilt into its makeup and how it works and proceeds the law of God. And oh, it's sinking in now. Okay. So, right. so if, if we have a nation, if, if we want to just, you know, drive off the, you know, the finger held high up into the heavens and we're going to do what we're going to do because, hey, we're grabbing, 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 right? You're going to pay for it. On the other hand, you say, look, um, you know, we're, we're going to have some basic principles. You know, like what George Washington said, for democracy to work, it requires a moral people. And he didn't say Christian people. He just said moral. Now, can non-Christians be moral? Yeah, I, I know all kinds of them. Some of them outshine Christians in their morality in, in many ways, right? that's why it's by grace not by works so anyway getting back to what you're saying is that's how i think we should think it through thank you myself no, now that that's you you said i, I know what you're saying yeah okay. and, and, and 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 if you want to hang it on terminology you know you you, you got you you can you can have uh mosaic law mosaic law is that which was given from sinai or you can talk about natural law Natural. So the Mosaic Law says don't steal. And if a person listens and observes and has some basic sensibilities, he'll say, I shouldn't steal. Well, how did this guy find that? Well, Paul said it was written on his heart as being made in the image of God. There it is. He's part of this creation, and there's something about it being built into it. Being pre wired. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Pastor, if uh, we were talking about. In the back of the wave of curse coming, mm -hmm. if and that's by faith dealing. Now, if we look at the covenant prologue back back to Noah, can you apply it in that event as well with Noah? Is that by faith or? Yeah. Can you apply? I don't that? know. I don't, I don't get your question. With Noah knowing that the flood is coming. Yes. Curse, right? Yes. Is that applicable in that event as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, but I, I, th I think it goes along. It, you're, 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 it's not Mosaic law. It's natural law coming upon the whole world, right? And But Noah is not the recipient of that curse. Mm -hmm. He is not receiving that curse. He, 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 is, he, he knows he's not receiving that curse. Matter of fact, Noah is identified as being righteous, and that's why he's not receiving that curse. Where curse. Habakkuk does receive it. Yeah. And he lives beyond that. His life is wiped out, yeah. But he's looking to the eternal. And Noah, Noah, who is a type of Christ, see, he's identified as righteous, and then the rest of his family, who's connected to him, who are not identified particularly as righteous, but are connected to him, have a living relationship with him, uh, are delivered because of his righteousness through and arrive in the new creation. I mean, pictorially speaking, you know. I mean, you know, we find out on one hand, yeah, it's a new creation. There's no more sinners here. But on the other hand, guess what? All those sinners that were left behind are still living in who? The drunken naked guy laying out there in the sand, Noah. Yeah. Problem still not fixed. So anyway, and you know, you know, the you know, being naked—that's like Adam, and you know, so yeah.
which does or which does not mean to say that if you live a good life, you get to go to heaven. Right. It doesn't. Because no matter how good your life gets, it's still uh, lived in a low, a low level. There is the natural law, the good, you know, like your brother. Like yeah. Because I, I know some... My, my brother will never have a moment of, of a single thought of, I'm going to do this to the glory of God. Yeah. And you know something? That is an abomination to God. Because he was made to give glory to God in his yeah. life. But I hope that he'll know that before he dies. Yes. Sooner. I hope tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but that requires regeneration. That requires a new heart, the heart transplant. Right. Yeah. And that's where it really changes internally who you are and your self-identity and what you are about in life. And even that righteousness that comes out of that doesn't justify you or make you righteous. You need a perfect righteousness. Not only does the non-Christian fall short of it, but we fall short of the perfect righteousness of God. There's some substantive, genuine reflection, but it's not perfect. So nobody's justified. Justification never occurs out of what you produce. It occurs from a gift of what Christ has accomplished. Okay, because because relig religion, religion which is not the gospel says we got to be good and we got to conform to what God says. Do this and live. You'll st you'll still die from that, regardless of how much you ask God to help you to do it or whatever. You have to be you have to have perfect righteousness for heaven. Where are you going to get that? You're not going to produce it. The Holy Spirit won't even produce it out of your life. You'll always be a, a mixed bag in this world. You're both sinner and saint. But the day will come when we will stand holy and blameless before God and our sanctification will meet with our justification in the world to come. But until then, there's the gap. I like how the first chapter brought that out. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So... Um, Romans 10, then is Galatians 3, 6 through 14 is another passage. And, and when we come to the end of everything we're doing here and have the questions and answer time in our 13th meeting, uh, depending on how that goes, we might just spend some time in Galatians chapter 3 on some kind of detailed exegesis of it. But just to, just to, bring, uh, to bring to the forefront uh, Paul's contrast between the principle of the Old Covenant which is uh, obedience to the law for righteousness, cursing f for any infraction, uh, versus the principle of the new covenant in Jesus Christ, that righteousness is not by doing the law, but it's by faith in Jesus Christ who has done the law. Here's Paul in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, he starts speaking, uh, going all the way back to Abraham, uh, was justified by faith. Verse 6, even so Abraham believed God, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Okay, so they're, 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 they're the gospel's operative before the gospel even occurs with the coming of Christ. Uh, it's the retroactive gospel, okay? And then uh, in verse 10, <clears throat> for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Okay, there's the requirement of the law itself. Now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, where is he quoting from there? Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2.4, right. However, the law is not of faith. See the contrast? The law is not. There's something about the law as a covenant that is not of a grace covenant. The law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who does them or practices them shall live by them. And Paul is quoting what? Leviticus 18.5. So there it is. So Paul is putting together side by side he, Habakkuk 2.4, Leviticus 18.5. He's saying these are contrary principles of inheritance. Both have live at the end. If you keep it, you'll live. If you believe it, you'll live. Both have the end, the sanction. 
But the way there is two entirely different covenant administrations. See what I mean? <clears throat> All right, 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, the two covenants are in contrast, not in continuum. 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested. You are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone. So there you go. What? Who did Paul believe wrote on the tablets of stone? The Spirit of the living God. But now he's not writing on tablets of stone. The new covenant, he's writing on tablets of human hearts. So the law that was external, written on stone, that judged hearts of stone, now is internal, written in a, on hearts of flesh. Not that we are at, uh, in such in such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything coming from ourselves. Our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants or ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Okay, so the old covenant kills, but the new covenant. Is a ministry of life. So if I comply with the terms of the old covenant, I'll sin, I'll be killed. If I comply with the terms of the ministry of the new covenant and believe it, even though I may sin afterwards, I still have life. Because I have Christ. I have the all the benefits of the new covenant. If the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because the glory of his face fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Okay, so one's glorious. The glory cloud of the Spirit was there in Sinai and the writing of the tablets and so forth. But the new covenant is even with greater glory. Verse 9, for if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Notice how Paul contrasts the two covenant administrations. One is death, one is life. One is condemnation, one is righteousness. The righteousness that God requires for life is given as a gift in the new covenant. And if you can't get that, if you don't see your need for that, then the only other righteousness you got is what you can generate. And I'll tell you ahead of time where that's going. It won't cut it on Judgment Day. It's condemnation. So the Old Covenant, as a historic administration terminates with condemnation on the people in the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant in Jesus Christ, it terminates in the people of the Covenant in life. There's the contrast between the two. So you see what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant standing in contrast, not in continuum to each other. There's something distinctive that puts them in a contrasting, not a con not in a continuum where there's there's more grace, there's less grace here, but now we have more grace now. That's not the way Paul perceives it at all. That's you're you're headed down a wrong track, and you know, all you're going to come out with with that formula is sometime some type of a formulation, <clears throat> which I've come to call gospel. There it is, folks. It's it it is. It, it is the uh, it is the message of the day, gospel, and it parades about as being gospel. And so, it, P Paul, if you want gospel, you got to understand there's a con contrast that Paul is creating here, not a continuum. Yes. Um, if the two con covenants are 
so contrasting and they're not unified in providing grace, then why do we have the covenant of works since it's only by the covenant of grace that anyone can be saved? Why do we have it? Because it has to be fulfilled. God's justice requires its fulfillment. And the question is, how does it get fulfilled? It has to be fulfilled. We're created. It's part and parcel of our creation in relationship to God, in being made in the image of God and being obliged to him, that we are in a covenant of works relationship with him. And every day of our lives, the debt is growing. So it's there because it's part of our created order. But, and it has to be fulfilled. It can't, it's not just disregarded. You know, it's not like, you know, if I, if I get together with my friends and we're playing Clue and we finally decide, you know, I'm bored, let's not play this, let's play Monopoly, you know. I mean, you know, Clue's done, now let's do the Monopoly, and that's different games and different rules and how it works. Wonderful. But that's not what we're talking about. We're, talk, we're, we're saying that the law has to be fulfilled in order for the dynamic of the covenant of grace to work. And that means that Christ has to come and fulfill the terms of that, satisfy it completely, uh, it, it, and because God's justice is bound up in it. So he has to satisfy those terms so he can now turn around and offer us the same life, this, the, the very righteousness we need and the very life as the outcropping of it, as a gift by grace, because he's fulfilled the terms of it. You know, I don't know on the edge with all this stuff, but I know in the Old Testament they had the animal sacrifices, and the animals had to be without, without any imperfections. Spot, right, right. Right, well, the only human with imperf that has no imperfections is Christ. Right. So that kind of is a little bit of a bridge there. To it's a picture. It's typology. And it administered to those who were of faith, right? It comforted them and strengthened them in that faith. Without yeah. the covenant of works, there would be no need for Christ. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that life need for that was being offered to us in the law, that is the same life that's being offered to us in grace. Yes. It's yeah. just being fulfilled. Yes. And it couldn't, you can't have, you can't have one without the other. It's, yes. They go together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the covenant of works with the Mosaic covenant? Uh, just a continuation of the Mosaic Covenant of Works with Adam? Yeah. Uh, n no. It, it, it's, a, it's, a discreet, it's a discreet historic administration to reflect that covenant. Because it wants, it, we want to bring home uh, the, the fallenness of our situation. Otherwise, <clears throat> if it was, uh, we... Habakkuk would have more to whine about than the fact that he didn't have many grapes to eat or he, he couldn't find any ox or cattle in the stall. Um, he, he would have had an, the eternal judgment of God. So it, 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 it functioned on a distinctly historical and typological level as a reflection and a continuation of the central covenantal principle of life by works, death for disobedience. So this functioned on a this, fun this function on an eternal scale, this function on a temporal scale, but a reflection of the eternal. That's why when you get to Jesus, you know, it, it, it comes back, you know, and I keep the law for eternal life. See, it's, they, 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 the one's reflecting the other. Yes? It's important to realize that you wouldn't understand the covenant grace without the covenant of the law because without the law you don't realize you're dead you don't realize your violation and thus you're standing before God so grace would be meaningless to you without the covenant of works you would not be able to understand <laughs> the covenant of grace without it that's right that's why it's a twofold in your Bible of the covenants you have to understand works to understand grace the covenant of law and works explains why you need the covenant of grace. That's why you can't just preach the covenant of grace. It's unable to be understood by people yeah. without the covenant of law and works. Yeah, yeah. If somebody doesn't think he's going to hell because he's a sinner condemned, grace. then, well, I'm glad Jesus is making you happy. <laughs> what? Hey, baby. <laughs> Jesus is making you happy, and that ain't all.
He's saving my soul. He's saving my body. He's saving my life. Happiness is just a, you know, a sidebar. Yes. Oh, don't click? Oh. Yeah. Stop, man. Okay, let's, let's press on here. Okay, number three, covenants, not testaments. All right. The quickie version here. Where did the word testaments come from? Okay, well, what happened is this. I'm just going to give the quick version of this, and if, if this doesn't work for you, then, you know, I, I would say, you know, you, you can, there's resources to pursue this more, and I don't want to overly belabor it. I was going to say Halloween. In the Old Testament, you have the word berit, okay, English transliteration of the Hebrew word for covenant, berit. Well, does everybody know what the LXX is? Septuagint. Yes, the Septuagint, and it's called the 70Y. 70, 70 scholars and Alexander. 70 rabbis. Oh, boy, you got it all, don't you? Good. Okay, so in what language was the Septuagint written in? Greek. Greek, because Alexander had conquered, the Hellenized the world, and Koine Greek was coming in uh, and becoming the lingua franca of the world. So they translated the Old Testament Hebrew into the Septuagint, which is Greek. So when they came to the word berit, within the world of Greek vocabulary, they had two choices. They had the word diatheke and syntheke. Those are the two words they had to pick from. The word diatheke in the Greek orbit of usage had to do with the word testament, last, you know, last will and testament. Okay, uh, kids, uh, who gets what? <coughs> I don't know, what, what does mom and dad's last will and testament say? Right? It had to do with portioning out the inheritance for the future. Soon they came. Oh, oh, and th this... This emphasized, you know, the sovereignty of the testator. What he said goes. Suntheke was contractual. Was contractual, and consequently there is a realm of negotiation that could occur between the parties to settle in upon the terms of the, of the relationship. Now, either of these words could be translated or called bereaved covenant. They had to use one or the other. Well, the decision was that suntheke is out. We're going to use diatheke to translate it breed. And the understanding was that even though neither of these words fully captured the Old Testament meaning, nonetheless, we had to pick some Greek word to carry some, you know, s some significance an understanding of what the bereed of the old covenant was. So diatheke was the choice, and it meant in the Greek, testament. But you have to understand that at the end of the day, when you take one word from one language to capture a word in another language, it undergoes, it undergoes a reshading. It gets new nuances, or even a significantly different meaning from its meaning in this other world other language uh, orbit, all right? So consequently, what happened then is when people started understanding what the, 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 these two bodies of literature are called, rather than going back and saying, well, they're berets, as Paul calls them in 2 Corinthians, they're two berets, uh, they called them two diatheikes, i.e. testaments. So not only did they Hellenize the Old Testament, but they went more than Hellenizing it. They totally lost some of it. So anyway, therefore, if we want to get closer to the true biblical meaning of the word, uh, we should stick not with testament. Uh, that really is, is a Greek detour 
of taking too literally and strongly the Greek meaning of what the real word is, the Hebrew barit. Uh, and all that is a Greek word that we shouldn't allow to erase and, and mold the Hebrew word, but the, whole, the Hebrew word should fill out the Greek word in our understanding. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So we have in our Bibles what we call the Old and New Testaments. They really should be called Old and New Covenants, okay? So anyway, that's the basic story. If you want more on that, there's things you can read out there and spend your time on. But that's the basic story. Old and New Covenants, not Old and New Testaments. This is not a, a testament, the last will and testament. This is a covenant. And uh, both, both Old and New mean covenant, but they're different kinds of covenant. <coughs> and that's... <coughs> That's the critical feature to, to, to retain the difference. Okay, Hebrews 8 through 10. Law and sacrifice, typology, old and new. Uh, <coughs> I want to move on, so we're just we're going to jam this real quick. Uh, if you're familiar with eight, uh, Hebrews 8 through 10, uh, Hebrews 8 introduces the new covenant. Hebrews 9 and 10 uh, then discuss the... Uh, uh, Contrast between Old and New Covenant liturgy, uh, that is worship in the temple, and also Old and New Covenant sacrifices uh, that were made, and the differences, how the Old could never take away sin, and the New uh, Testament, the New Covenant sacrifice in Jesus Christ, uh, once and for all, uh, is able uh, to deal with the problem uh, of sin. And the New Covenant delivers uh, where the old covenant could not. The new covenant, in quoting Jeremiah on the basis of uh, Christ's once and for all sacrifice, really brings forgiveness. And here's the beauty of it all. You know, Habakkuk had to live life in the old covenant world, though a believer, and knowing he had hinds feet on high places, he still had to live his life with the curse sanction hovering over him, and knowing it could fall, and it did. The believer in Jesus Christ no longer has that threat. We're no longer under law in a typological sense. We are in a practical sense, though. Practical, some, pra some practical ways. But, Consequentially. Yeah, but there's certain consequences that can happen. But, you know, something, if, if you're living your life and some bad things happen and, you know, to you and your life, you know, if, if you're in Israel, you, you You'd, you'd have good reason to question, okay, is this part of the curse sanction? Uh, you, I violated something. <laughs> yeah. No, suffering is part of the Christian life. And living in a fallen world, you get fallout of living in that fallen world. But that's not an indication that somehow God's justice is catching up with you and it being administered in your life, as it was in the old covenant situation. That's very important that we understand that as believers. Um, Would you say the mark of a New Testament believer is suffering? Oh, of course. That was one of the reasons why Paul's ministry was not being well received by a lot of Jewish type Christians is we're tired of this suffering. We don't want to You don't look to you don't look yeah, you don't look like you're having this blessed life that I read about in the Bible that, you know, the, the Mosaic covenant outlines. You seem to be getting. You seem to be operating under the curse sanctions. You're getting beat up everywhere you go, and he lists all these things about all these horrendous things that happened to him. And so he's got these, you know, you got these prosperity preachers in Second Corinthians just saying, "Hey, do you want to be like him, or do you want to be like us, man? We're living the life. We want to be like you. Your best life now. If you send me all your money, I'll live like that too. <laughs> yep. Got your best life now versus your worst life now. So. But anyway, um, Christ is the true sacrifice <clears throat> which satisfies the law's demands regarding righteousness for blessing and cursing for sin. So in other words, what did the law call for? You break it, you're cursed. You keep it, you're blessed. Okay. What's, what does the new covenant do? What does Christ come and do? Number one, he bears the curse sanction of the law in his person, and he actually obtains the righteousness. 
So that the law is in Jesus Christ as an administration of a covenant of works is fulfilled. He bears its curse. He obtains its righteousness in our behalf. And in, 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 and that's in terms of law. Then in terms of <clears throat> uh, type, you know, he is the Lamb of God, right? There's no more need for animal sacrifices and, and on. You know, there's no more visible altar. There's no more Levitical priesthood. Christ is a Melchizedekian priest. There's no more temple where all this stuff occurs. I mean, the, the, the landscape changes because we're moving from type, earthly, into the heavenly reality. And you would also say also why we don't have <clears throat> new revelation or prophets or popes in the New Testament or today because they, they were all summed up in Christ, correct? Because... Jesus Christ would have been our last prophet, priest, and king. Well, the office of prophet culminates in Christ in the New Covenant. That doesn't prevent prophets as part of the New Covenant era any more than it prevents apostles, all right? But you have to realize that that, that is the New Covenant uh that is the New Covenant prophet that's that, that that has come to its completion in Christ, all right? So when we say Jesus is our last word. We don't mean we stop with the Gospel of John. All right, that that's that's the that'd be the wrong end point. Uh, we say Jesus is our last word. Is we stop with the final the last apostle, First Corinthians fifteen a. That means that, that we have a closed canon. All right, so that, that 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 that's that, that's Ephesians two twenty. All right. So he fulfills the Old Testament types, therein achieving eternal heavenly life. Jesus doesn't achieve temporal life. You know, your best life now philosophy, all right? For all the people of God. Now, just a point that I've been kind of storing and hiding and waiting uh, to share with you is that um, in the Old Testament, we have... In Deuteronomy and other other places, this this these words prolong days, prolong days, and uh, you and I don't have verses from Deuteronomy. You can look it up in a concordance, but you know if, if you keep the law, you have prolonged days, and also prosperous days. You live long. You know, the, 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 the fifth commandment, honor your father, your mother, that what? Your days may be prolonged in the land. All right, so prolonged days in, in the land uh, is, is typological language for eternal life, right? So to live long in the land is a picture of having long life, eternal life. Now, I draw your attention to that because of Psalm 91 which speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as the Messiah, tells us that... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just read those verses. Psalm 91 at the end of the psalm. Because he's loved me, I will deliver him. Well, thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Delivered from what? What's the Lord Jesus Christ need deliverance from? Death. He died. He needs deliverance. I will set him securely on high. Exaltation, being set on high. Because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Speaking of Christ. And then here it is. With prolonged life, I will satisfy him. Let him behold my salvation. As he's delivered from the jaws of death. Prolonged life. Now when Jesus is raised from the dead delivered with long life, prolonged days from an Old Testament perspective, what is it saying about Jesus' resurrection? He's going to live to be 100, not just 70 like the rest of it. No, that's Old Testament typological terminology for eternal life. When Jesus is raised from the dead and for the resurrection, he's raised with prolonged days, i.e. eternal life. So we need to understand that. Isaiah 53, we'll, we'll be looking at later. 
uh, Isaiah 53, at the end there, uh, it, it uses the same language with regard to the Messiah, that he'll be a guild offering, and, and yet he will have prolonged days. Uh, he will be raised to eternal life. Okay, Acts 2 and uh, Exodus 20, uh, real quick here. Acts 2 and Exodus 20. Uh, I, I trust everybody knows what Acts 2 is about. But these are the two mountains. Uh, uh, these are the two Bible mountains. These are the two revelatory mountains. Sinai and Zion are the two mountains from which we receive uh, the Word of God. And these are the two mountains from which the two covenant communities are formed. On the day of the assembly at Sinai, the old covenant community is formed as a covenant community, and they're given the word of God. M Moses ascends into the mountain. He descends with the word of God. Uh, and, and, and coming out of that very arena of uh, entering into covenant with God, they break covenant and 3,000 people die. These are the communities that have been redeemed. Israel was redeemed through the Red Sea. and Now they come and they're formed into the covenant community. Now, Pentecost is the other. Pentecost was a day in which the Jews celebrated the giving of the law. <clears throat> but the law is not being given on Zion this time, like it was on Sinai, where you have what? You have this mountain of, uh, is a mountain of threatening, but no, what's happened is you have the new covenant community that's being formed on the day of Pentecost. When you have the Lord Jesus Christ who's ascended into the heavenlies, into the mount, and now he's coming back in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what is the chief gift that is poured out on the day of Pentecost? It is the word of prophecy, the word of God. And so Peter proclaims the word of God to the new covenant community, and they are formed in the proclamation of, of Christ and in the new covenant we have on Mount Sinai the, the glory cloud of the spirit we have on Zion the glory cloud of the spirit coming down in the outpoured Holy Spirit and tongues of fire and in great joy uh, we also have at the end of this uh, event this new covenant new covenant event at the foot of the Mount Zion, where Christ is now seated as king, uh, the, the burning question with response to the word of God that Peter preached, what shall we do? Right. That should echo Mount Sinai. <laughs> all the Lord spoke to me will do. Okay, if we've crucified the Messiah and all this stuff has happened. He's sitting at the right hand of God in power on the throne of David. What shall we do? And what's the answer? To that? Repent and be baptized and you shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of eternal life. And so we see that these two mounts are the sources from which come uh, from he who ascends and then descends uh, with the old covenant canon, the old covenant word for the old covenant community. And then we see with Mount Zion and the day of Pentecost, Christ who ascends, descend, descends in the Spirit with a new covenant word, which is a word of salvation. Isn't it, isn't it remarkable? Isn't it remarkable that 3,000 are cursed because the law is broken on Sinai? And how many people are recorded as saved? 3,000. 3,000. On that day. That's just coincidence. Yeah, it probably wasn't. It's got interesting, though. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Cursed and saved, 3,000. Hmm. Type and shadow stuff all throughout your Bible. It's so, one of many. <laughs> uh, I kind of revamped. This is my revamping of Augustine. You might want to stay with Augustine, but I kind of like this. The new is retroactive in the old. And the old is realized and raised in the new. So, so even though, even though you have 
during this Old Covenant administration, on, on a typological level, okay, you got this type level, right, where curses are raining down upon the covenant community. On another level, on an individual level of faith, you got people who are saved in the Old Covenant. Right? So you got, and, 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 and after Sinai in Exodus, you have the animal sacrificial system, right? Those fed and administered and encouraged and strengthened the faith of, of, of those who believed, even while they're laboring under a typological level of the curse sanction. So this is how, this is how you have a singular uh, covenant of grace that's retroactive, prior to the cross, all right? You know, how can anybody get grace when Jesus hasn't died yet and lived? How can I get it? Well, you get it retroactively. And I looked up this word retroactive in my dictionary. I wanted to read it to you. I like this. It's good. Very good. Retroactive, influencing, or applying to a period prior to enactment. Isn't that good? Retroactive pays pretty good, too. <laughs> it's just, it's, it is. Influencing, influencing or applying to a period prior to enactment. Retroactive. So you have, you have retroactive grace from the cross at work, even though you have this curse sanction hovering over and being applied temporally and typologically to the life of God's people. But this will finally be fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ. The type will be laid to rest. And the confidence of God's people will be great because and of... And we see that, as you Meredith Kleinians always uh, point out, Genesis 3.15. That's right. Well, and then when they got the animal sacrifice clothes on the... Got the new clothes from the animal skins. The retro clothes. Yep, the retroactive clothes. <laughs> so the new is retroactive in the old, and the old is realized, realized, and raised in the new. So if you got blessing, is there a blessing in the promised land? In the new, you have blessing on an eternal scale. It's raised. Everything's raised up. The life we have in Christ. Okay? All right. Now. Did you everybody read chapter one? Yes, you All right. Covenant of redemption. I gave you yours. Oh, I forgot. I gotta go. We gotta go something else first. I forgot. I, I got. I got my notes out of order. We have. We have to look at the unfolding drama. If you've been my uh, foundations class, you've seen. You've been through this, but you have to go through it again because it's part of this too. The unfolding drama of the covenants in Scripture, number room numeral four. I forgot about that. We gotta go through this. That's why I have this drawn up here. All right. Hey, can I fix your collar real quick? What? Can I fix your collar real quick? I'm weird. OCD is a horrible thing. Thank you. You know, if I go in a room and the pictures are off, I'll sit there. I'll start. I'll get a level. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um... In my church, uh, I've assigned one of the ladies the freedom to, uh, to fix me if I look wrong up there on Sunday mornings because after church, she came up and fixed me once. And my, well, collar was, my collar was like a couple of wings that were sticking out. If you look at the, look at the, uh, the you know, he recorded it. And I got these wings. The and I said, look, I said, look, it's, it's Susan Lang, if you know who it is. I said, Susan, I said, anytime I just come and fix it, don't. <laughs> All right. The unfolding drama of the covenants in Scripture. 
Here's a lovely little quote. This guy's a Catholic, so I don't like him particularly. But nonetheless, what he had to say here was good. And, uh, you know, um, I've, do, I've got a lot of commentaries on the Gospel of John, and some of the best ones are by Catholics, believe it or not. Catholics? Pew. I said, couldn't, couldn't possibly be, but it's true. But so you, you never know when, you know, somebody's going to come up with some good truth. You study the Word of God and dig into it. You never know what's going to come up with. So here it is. If we could delete all references to covenant in the Old Testament, which we could not possibly do, precisely because it is regularly integral to the contents, we would have an anthology of stories. As it is, we have a structure that can house a plot. Okay? So, a plot line carries the story along. And if without a plot, it's just this story happened here and this story happened here. It's, it's kind of like when you get together the family and people tell stories. You know, you don't generally have a plot line. You know, at the end of the day, you go home and, you've, and you recorded the stories and you go, hey, this is a whole story. No, it isn't. It's just, everybody's just kind of spinning off whatever got their, caught their fancy in the moment. And it was all interesting and good. But, it was, but you had an evening of anthologies. You know, we have an anthology of stories without a plot line. And what is the plot line of Scripture? Or to put it this way, what is the bones that hold the flesh together structurally in the biblical storyline? The answer to that question is covenant. Covenant is what does it for us. It carries it along. Uh, so first of all, we start with the, Abra the Adamic covenant. That is the covenant with Adam, where paradise and Sabbath rest for Adam depended upon obedience or works. So in other words, uh, when, when God said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die, the flip side of that is, if you do not eat of it, you will live. Right? And life is seen in at least two different ways uh, in uh, that. Uh, first, the tree of life of course, but also in the Sabbath. Because what is being held out to Adam in his uh, terrestrial earthly existence, a man of dust, uh, was the prospect of becoming not a man of dust, but translated into a, a glorified man, raised up into a higher level, which we would call the Sabbath arena. Six days the Lord made heaven and earth, in the morning and the evening, each of those days are framed. But on the seventh day, he rested. He sat up on his throne, Isaiah 66. And there is no morning and evening formula uh, to the Lord's uh, sitting up on his throne in, in rest uh, at the end of creation. But this was the goal for man, to join God in his Sabbath rest. It was the goal for mankind. But whether mankind would uh, reach that uh, intended terminus was dependent upon a covenant. Now, the Westminster Confession, if you're familiar with that, says that when God created man, he, he could only get fruition uh, by way of a covenant. Well, what kind of a covenant was Adam given? Was it a covenant of grace or a covenant of works? Of course, it is a covenant of works, so he had to obey God and say no to evil. Uh, in order to uh, arrive there. Of course, we know what, this, what happened in that storyline is Adam sinned and uh, was driven out of the garden. He lost the prospect of the Sabbath rest of God as the terminus for his existence at the end of world history uh, because of his disobedience. But thank God the storyline didn't end there, but we have what is often been referred to as the Proto-Evangelium, which is the first form of the covenant of grace. In other words, its retroactive uh, form appears in Genesis 3.15, when after man had fallen, uh, giving heed to the word of the devil rather than to the word of the Lord, he says to him, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, uh, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So in other words, uh, from the seed of the woman, 
in future generations. One will come forth who will crush the head of the serpent. In other words, the great head crusher uh, would come from the seed of the woman. But in crushing the head of the serpent, his heel would be bruised. He would suffer through it. And you can find various reliefs and uh, other ancient Near Eastern uh, 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 artwork, uh, pictures of kings with their foot on the neck uh, or on the head uh, of their uh, kings that they defeat. And this is the picture being here. The heel is on the head, but the heel is bruised in the process. And of course, uh, we've recognized this as the first installment of the covenant of grace, the, the first retroactive appearance of the covenant of grace that Jesus would defeat Satan, even though Adam uh, did not uh, defeat him. And then uh, compatible and along with it, uh, before the Lord has them leave the garden, he gave him that first promise uh, to the seed of the woman. Uh, in other words, a future one would arise to be the head crusher. Uh, we have also verse 21. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So they had clothed their own nakedness with their own design, uh, with their own fig leaves, their own efforts to deal with their sin on their own and cover it up and try to, you know, hide it and find a way of life without it. But God came and actually dealt with their sin. He covered them with animal skins. Of course, covering them with animal skins tells you two things, doesn't it? Number one, that animal had to die. In other words, there had to be a shedding of blood for that to occur. And number two, it tells us that the one who's Blood is shed, will clothe Adam and Eve. So in other words, what we have from the very beginning are the blessings of justification by faith. The blessings of justification by faith is forgiveness through the blood of Christ and perfect righteousness to cover us from the obedience of Christ. So there we have, we have the retroactive gospel uh, all the way back with Adam and Eve. So will Adam and Eve be in heaven? And it says in the New Testament somewhere, I don't have my Bible in front of me, I have it marked, but it says we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. So, so therefore, I mean, that just goes back to Adam and Eve right. in the, the, the kingdom prologue. Right on. All the way back. So then we have the development of world culture. And as world culture develops, we have two seeds. We have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The seed of the woman are those who are responsive to God's grace and covenant. And the seed of the serpent are those who are not. And by the time you get to Noah, uh, you find uh, that there's only one man that God can call righteous in any true sense of the word. And um, don't really know about the spiritual condition of the rest of his family, and, but Noah's the one who is singled out because he's functioning as a type of Christ. And uh, in Genesis 6.18, it says, I will establish my covenant with Noah. That is the covenant that was already active back then uh, in that retroactive phase. We'll miss you. Good night. See you again Bye. soon. <clears throat> and then uh, with the uh, Noahic flood, which is a picture of the judgment of the world and the salvation of God's people through the righteousness of Christ, for those who gathered into the ark, they pass through those troublesome waters and they enter into the new creation. Then out of that world in Genesis chapter 9, there is this very colorful rainbow that God gives, and with that gives a promise, a promise that he will um, not flood the world again, and that seed time and harvest and autumn and winter and spring and summer will, will happen. And so what we have is we have a covenant that's made with all flesh. Uh, it's 
is said, the, Abra the, uh, the Noahic covenant made with all flesh. And it's called a common grace covenant. God withholds his judgment. God preserves the world, allows world history to develop with both believers and unbelievers, seed of the woman, seed of the serpent. Both are able to exist together on the same planet, interacting together, maybe engaging in various cultural activities, building cities or whatever they may do, though there will be a spiritual distinction between the two. And then God... Again, the, the world uh, after Noah again grows again, and we find that the world is growing dark and evil again, and God again ra raises up a single man, and this single man's name is Abraham. Now, the last time God raised up a single man named Noah, you know what happened to the nations of the world? They all got wiped out. They came under God's curse. But now with Abraham, as he raises up Abraham, the single man, what does he say to Abraham? In you, what? All the nations of the world will be blessed. Whoa. There's a fantastic promise of the covenant of grace that's telling us that this covenant, uh, initially retroactively seen with just the couple, Adam and Eve, and just preserving eight people through the ark, that this covenant was going was gonna to flower at some time. That this, cover was gonna, this covenant was going to go global, and there would be blessing throughout the earth. And so God made a number of promises to Abraham. First, he said something about his seed would be very great, like the sand of the sea and the stars in the sky. Great seed. The second thing he said about that seed is this seed of Abraham, there would be this vast seed, would also uh, enter in uh, to the promised land and dwell there. And Abraham was given boundaries of what that promised land would be and told and promised and assured him. But he also told Abraham that the world would be blessed. All the families of the world would be blessed through Father Abraham. And, uh, and, and also he told him that kings would come out of him. So essentially what God told Abraham is that this promised land over there in the Mideast would become a land populated with his seed where they would be blessed and have kings, the whole kingdom emerging. And that would be the great promise uh, to, God, to Abraham and his seed. Then you find after Abraham there's Isaac, there's Jacob. And Jacob then had 12 sons who became identified as the 12 tribes of Israel. It was, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And those people went down to Egypt because of Joseph. And there they, they incubated in Egypt. How many people went down to Egypt initially? Do you remember? Seven. Yeah, about 70. So they incubated down there for several hundred years. And how many did they become after incubating and growing? They became about Two, three million. Yeah, a lot. Huge. So the culture, so the promise to multiply and fill the earth was happening within that little incubated area of Goshen. It was enough that Pharaoh got scared. Yeah, <laughs> it was enough they said, hey, if these guys got serious and started making weapons, uh, we could have a problem in our hand. <laughs> so, of course, uh, Pharaoh leaned on him, and then God sent Moses, and Moses leaned on Pharaoh, and leaned on Pharaoh about ten times. And finally, after killing Pharaoh's son, uh, <laughs> after gnats and flies and frogs and what have you, uh, he said, okay, go ahead and go worship your God wherever you want to go worship it. So they went out, and, and they went out because they were sent out because they went out through the blood of the Lamb, through the Red Sea, both redemptive uh, anticipations of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in in. In, in being redeemed through the blood and, and, and passing through the exodus waters of baptism to um, go to Mount Sinai. And there the, the people of the Abrahamic covenant, the seed of Abraham, uh, are brought to Sinai. And then you'll see in your sheet the, the Mosaic covenant as though incorporating the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, the Abrahamic covenant was there. 
The Abrahamic covenant was operative. You want to draw that little line there, the Abrahamic covenant. So you can see it's operative all along, and it goes all the way back to Eden. That's the that's the Abrahamic covenant. So it was operative in the, in the Mosaic. It was present, but that Mosaic covenant, as we've seen, and I hope you agree with that, is characterized by a works principle for tenure in the land, and thus can be seen in a different sense. Uh, as, as a covenant of grace or works, depending on how you look at it. On one level, you can say, yeah, it was a covenant of grace for, for faith. But on another level, as a nation, uh, it existed in the covenant of works for tenure in the land. Uh, and then uh, Charles Hodge picks up this, this, you might say, this tension in their tenure in the land and the covenant of works, yet on another hand, the covenant of grace being functional. And, I, and I, I, I have the quote here if you want to follow it along. He says, besides this evangelical character, which unquestionably belongs to the Mosaic covenant, it is present in two other aspects in the word of God. First, it was a national covenant with the Hebrew people. In this view, the parties were God and the people of Israel. The promise was national security and prosperity. And the condition was the obedience of the people as a nation to the Mosaic law. The mediator was Moses. In this aspect, it was a legal covenant. It said, do this and live. Secondly, it contained, as does also the New Testament, a renewed proclamation of the original covenant of works. These different aspects under which the Mosaic economy is presented account for the apparently inconsistent way in which it is spoken of in the New Testament. So on one hand, you'll see Paul saying, hey, you're not under law, you're under grace. In another place, Paul will say, hey, children, obey your parents, even as the law tells us to. Call it, well, which is it? You know, Well, you have to understand the different senses in which it's being appealed to. Okay, so you have the Mosaic Covenant then is, is the covenant in which they are in fulfillment of the uh, Abrahamic promise. They are in the land. Here's, here's the Abraham, the promise, and now we have them in the land of promise. I got the blue. The reason I got the blue there is because this was called the land of rest. And because it was reflecting the Sabbath rest of God, the, the, the real. So it was, it was a, it was a, to, to be in the land was a type of the Sabbath rest of God above. But it was also a type because types not only incorporate something of the moment, but a type also looks forward to a future fulfillment what was the future fulfillment that the Abrahamic promise was looking forward to? What was the future fulfillment of the land and the seed of Abraham living in the land uh, looked forward to? Eternal land. Yeah, it's looking forward to this reality up here, this, 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 this true Sabbath rest of God that, that, that the people of God would enter into only uh, at, uh, uh, at, in the new covenant. Uh, when the Holy Spirit uh, would be poured out upon them. Uh, only when they would finally uh, arrive at the, uh, at the second coming in its visible, concrete sense of the word. So then the, the next covenant we have is the covenant with David, and that, that expands upon uh, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic, and, and I use a little orange chair. Uh, that's my artistic design of a throne uh, to sit upon. And, of course, David was the king of Israel. And there we have in a full-blown sense of the word, the fulfillment in full of the Abrahamic covenant that God told Abraham, your seed would dwell in the land and you would be like the sand of the seashore and, and kings would come for you. And then you have David, the great king of the Old Testament. And to David was made a promise that of his, one of his seed would sit upon his throne. Of course, I, I think I spoke earlier, or, or I can't remember if this group or another group, but, but well, where is the throne of David at? Where is where do we expect uh, the seed of David to sit upon uh, the throne of David? And the answer to that question is Acts chapter two: uh, Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father to sit upon the throne of David, not the typological throne on earth, but the anti-typological reality of the throne at the right hand of God, uh, the Father. 
Of course, that immediately cancels out any premillennial hope uh, because premillennial hope is based upon the expectation that the earthly throne of David is going to be repeated in the future millennium. Uh, this perspective puts the throne of David in heaven in its typological fulfillment, in its, 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 its fulfillment of its type, not the continuation of the type. And with Jesus Christ, we don't have the ongoing types, we have their fulfillment. Well, as you know, as the storyline goes along, uh, the, the children of Israel are dr driven out of the land uh, uh, into judgment. They suffer the cursed sanctions uh, of the covenant. But they are also brought back uh, uh, after 70 years of exile. And they're not brought back because they're so good now. They're brought back because of God's mercy and grace. And the bringing back of the children of Israel from Babylon under judgment back into the promised land is a picture of the gospel. This is Isaiah chapter 52. To be able to go to those people under judgment, under cursing, and say, good news. Come out of judgment. You're delivered. The Lord has forgiven you. Come and return to the land of life. That is, that, is a, that is a picture of the gospel itself. Isaiah 52 is quoted in Romans chapter 10. And then we have, as the storyline continues, we have the coming of Jesus Christ. And the first words out of his mouth in his public ministry is repent. Why? The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. And the preaching of Jesus Christ and of John the Baptist, and it's, and it's coming because Christ is here. And the kingdom is on the verge of appearing. The king himself is present. Yet the kingdom itself has not yet come. Because something has to happen in order for the kingdom to come. The eternal consummate kingdom of God. And that is that all these previous covenants have to be fulfilled, especially uh, this whole problem with the curse delivering Israel, uh, the, the curse driving Israel out of the land, the curse still hovering over Israel. Many two, New, New Testament scholars, for example, say even though when Christ came and began his public ministry and Israel was in the land, yet there was a sense they were still in exile. They were still under the God's curse. They were still under God's disfavor. And uh, that is completely true uh, particularly if you read Matthew chapter 1, uh, the very first chapter of the New Testament. Because in Matthew chapter 1, uh, Matthew divides up uh, the genealogies reaching back in the Old Testament with Abraham and David and the exile into Babylon. But there's no record of them coming back from exile. Matthew just leaves the storyline with them still in exile. Why? Because under, 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 under reality, they still will, were in exile. No, they're in the typological promised land. Yeah, they're there. They're in Jerusalem. They're in the land. But, but it, that, was just, that was all typological. The reality of you're still far away from God. You're still alienated from God. You're still, you have no hope of eternal life. You know, that, that was the reality. So Matthew, of course, beautifully picks up with that in the very first chapter of, of Matthew as he transitions from the Old Covenant into the New. And then what does Matthew do? He presents Jesus as the Savior. Jesus is the one who will bring people back from exile and bring them back uh, to God. Uh, the Old Covenant must be uh, satisfied. Its curse sanction uh, must be taken away. And of course, Christ does that on the cross. He does that as he is crowned with the crown of thorns, a picture uh, of the curse uh, sanction. And he brings uh, in his resurrection uh, eternal life. He is the righteous one that brings life. So the consummate kingdom is ratified. Christ can declare it. And he is the king uh, in whose presence is the kingdom of God. But it hasn't arrived yet uh, because uh, the blood has not been spilt. The door has not been reopened. And, of course, the new covenant then is the consummation of all the prior covenants. Uh, in uh, the Abrahamic realm, for example, uh, the promised land uh, of this kingdom of Old Testament Israel is realized when Christ is sitting upon the throne. Uh, 
uh, of David. And we have the promised land uh, available uh, to the people of God. Uh, the, the Sinaitic covenant uh, is fulfilled, as we've seen earlier, uh, particularly in its uh, curse, sanction, and call for righteousness in the cross of Christ and in his perfect life of obedience, providing forgiveness and a perfect righteousness. And then the Davidic covenant, of course, is fulfilled uh, in the heavenly places in Acts chapter 2, where uh, Psalm 110, that great psalm of the Old Testament, the psalm of David, uh, where Christ is seated upon the right hand of God in heaven. So the earthly uh, throne, the earthly land of the kingdom moves into the heavenly uh, realm uh, in Jesus Christ, which is the eternal uh, and the permanent realm. And so we see the Abrahamic covenant as a promise having two levels of fulfillment. The earthly level here, where you have a vast seed, uh, in the promised land in the Mideast. And then its ultimate fulfillment, there's its typological initial fulfillment, but then its ultimate fulfillment uh, comes about in the heavenly sphere uh, uh, e e where, where, the, where, where Christ is seated on the throne of David uh, in the Sabbath rest, the true land, the true inheritance uh, of the people of God. And that arena then, through the preaching of the church, and the preaching of the gospel, that land is being populated. People, every time someone says yes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're coming out of exile, and they're entering into the promised land. They're coming out of that dry valley of bones of Ezekiel chapter 37, and they're entering into the land of life in union and communion with Jesus Christ in the ultimate uh, sense of the word. So we, can, so we can say, in conclusion, that throughout the Bible, the covenant of works and grace find their grand fulfillment in the new covenant, which secures the elect and their inheritance in the consummate, antitypical kingdom of glory, that is the Sabbath glory kingdom, whereby uniting into one the people of God of all ages in Christ in the new creation. So any questions about what we've gone over here with regard to this chart that, that gives us the, what, what uh, Scott Hahn has identified as the plot line uh, of Scripture. Is there any covenant aside from Christ's covenant that still applies after, and Noah, and Noah's covenant uh, that still applies after he comes and he sacrifices the sacrifice on the cross? Common grace. Mm. Uh, 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 Noah's okay. common grace covenant. Yeah, yeah. So Noah's common grace covenant, which I have as this age, coming out of uh, you know Noah uh, and you know, preserving of the world, that's part and parcel of this age. That that remains in effect uh, until Christ comes back in power and glory. So you have the Noahic covenant, which is a common grace covenant for all people, preserving life, as 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 you might say, the canvas on which the new covenant is then built. And thus we have a covenant for all people. That's the preserving of this age until the end. And then you have the specific covenant, which is the gathering of God's uh, elect, his seed of Abraham, into the, in, into the promised land through the preaching of the gospel. Yes? Uh, I'm wondering about the context of, because uh, Hebrews in chapter 9 does talk about a testament. And it talks about the death of a testator. So how does that fit with the definition that you prefer? I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. If you want to read about four pages of Robertson's book, Christ of the Covenants, he does the exegesis on that very question. Because okay. um, otherwise we're going to be on a bit of a rabbit trail. And then if you'd be willing to read it, and, and see if see if the argument makes sense to you, and we could talk about it. But that's a good question because that's all, that's often brought up that very point. But I, I think, in my humble estimation, I think Robertson, who's an Old Testament scholar, persuasively shows how what that is talking about at the end of the day is covenant. But uh, I'll give it to you and read for your consideration. All right. Now, Rev, in the Reform world, you know. The 
reform thinkers are either, for the most part, either a mill or post mill. Does post mill uh, go with uh, your diagram there much? I mean, is there any? Does it go with it? Yeah, I mean, is there? No. There's no room on that board. Not really. <laughs> the board's okay. not big enough, Kevin. <laughs> uh, I, I just, yeah. Because in the reform world, you know. Okay, you. you you could say that, this, here's what you could say. You could say that the, that the fulfillment, okay, the promise is that uh, all nations are blessed, right? Blessed in Abraham, right? Yeah. Okay. So every family in the world will be blessed. And, and, and Galatians 3 makes it clear that that blessing is nothing other than the blessing of the gospel of justification and life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? That's the blessing of Abraham that we now enjoy. All right. Now, you could argue that, well, if, if all the nations will be blessed, that means, and you can read this in uh, Lorraine Bettner, uh, on his book on the millennium, is that the preponderance of the world will be converted. And we should have a very optimistic outlook that the progress of the gospel is going to issue in a large number of the world's population, the majority of the world's population being converted. And that's how he argues, which is a form of post-millennialism. Now, I, I don't believe personally that that is representative of a lot of other scripture. So I, I am more modest on the relationship of the number of the saved to the unsaved. And I think it's going to be more like a Noah situation, in, at least in terms that the majority of people will not believe. That Christians will operate in a minority and that toward the end of this program here, it's going to be ugly. That's what I think. Yeah. I don't think it's going to... In my research on the millennium, you know, but anyway. I, I, I read a lot of Dutch guys, but I didn't read a whole lot of Presbyterians because it seemed like, especially early America, uh, there, was, there was quite a few Presbyterians that were post mill. Um, not that there's, not that there's. Yeah, there's different forms of post mill too. For example, another another form of post millennialism that's distinctive is where the Dutch were not. Is a belief that there'll be a great revival they and conversion of Israel toward the end of of a physical bloodline of Jews at the end, and then there's that whole thing of Romans 11. But my opinion is, I think that's a misunderstanding of how to interpret Romans 11. But, uh, but Pastor, people I'm always people always be fighting over that. So you should, you should hope for the best, but plan for the worst. You know? Hey, <laughs> preach the gospel faithfully, and and let the Lord, you know, do what He does. Yeah. Success is not in how many numbers you get. Success is your faithfulness to the commission. So that's the bottom line. Okay, we have one other th we have one other thing we need to look at, but we're not going to do it tonight. Uh, I was hoping we were going to get to it tonight. That's why I handed out the sheets. So make sure you bring your sheets next week. And that is that is before time, in the realm of eternity, there is the covenant of redemption. Or if you like the really cool word, the pactum salutis. I read the note at the bottom. He loves it, man. <laughs> the, our Latin, our our Latin teacher. In my council of peace between them. Yeah, he had it. It's hard to say. Possibly, I'm not sure myself. If that, they somehow dovetail together. But I don't think they're quite exactly the same, but I think they're involved with each other, that council of peace and that, because it's between the persons of the Trinity. Right? Zechariah, you're 
Council of Peace. So, um, keep reading ahead. We'll catch up with our reading. And I thought well, I was going to do it tonight, but we didn't make it. So, but yeah, we don't meet next week. Two weeks. So keep up with the reading. We don't meet next week. Remember, no meeting. Come and be out of town. In the classes and all that stuff. And then we'll get to this covenant redemption, which I hope we're going to get to tonight, but we didn't make it. So we'll, we'll get there. All right? Let's pray.